As chef and co-owner of Blue Hill and Blue Hill at Stone Barns, Dan Barber blurs the line between the dining experience and education, bringing the principles of good farming directly to the table. Named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world, Dan recently co-founded Row 7, an organic seed company that brings together chefs and plant breeders in the development of new and delicious varieties of vegetables. Dan is the author of the New York Times best-selling book, The Third Plate, and has received multiple James Beard Awards, including Best Chef New York City and the country's outstanding chef honor. He challenges us to imagine a future cuisine that is as sustainable as it is delicious. Please welcome Dan Barber. an experience 10 years ago that I'm not going to forget. Uh, I had a visit from Chef Alan Ducasse to my kitchen. Have you heard of Chef Ducasse? Yeah, he's, he's widely considered the best chef in the world of our generation. He's my hero. And he was doing a photo shoot on the farm that's attached to the restaurant Blue Hill. And his assistant told me he had 20 minutes at 7 AM for a visit to the kitchen. And I wanted to serve Chef Ducasse something to eat. What do you serve the best chef of our generation at 7 AM? I went for bread and butter. <laughs> the bread was a no-brainer. We have been serving uh, this einkorn bread at Blue Hill for many years and, and become quite well known for it. It's freshly milled einkorn that has this just jaw-dropping, delicious flavor. I mean, the diner's like, sold their firstborn for a second bite kind of thing, you know? But it was the butter that I was really excited about. The butter was coming from my family farm in western Massachusetts, Blue Hill Farm. That my grandmother started in the 60s as an all-grass dairy, not a lick of grain. And I thought, with the pasturing protocols we had put in place, it was producing some of the best milk and cream and butter I had ever tasted. And I wanted Chef Ducasse to taste it and, and love it. And there he was in the kitchen, 7.05 AM, spreading the butter on the freshly baked bread. Now he took off his glasses, and he looked at the, the bread and butter and tasted and closed his eyes. Some kind of like rat tattoo moment, I think. He had grown up on a dairy farm <laughs> in France, and, and he knew his milk, knew his cream, knew his butter. And he took a bite. At, I felt like it lasted like an hour, you know? And when he opened his eyes, he looked at me, and he said, great. You know how when people say great, they don't really mean great? You know, you know like, how was your meal? Great. No, it wasn't. You know, so I, I didn't take, I pushed him. And, and I thought to myself, why not push him? Here I am alone with Ducasse at 7.07 .07 in the morning in my restaurant. When am I ever going to have him again? And I want to learn from him, this, this hero chef. So in my, my most polite, awkward French, asked him, chef, you've been the greatest inspiration for me and all these other could on and on. Could you tell me what you really think about the butter? And again, he said, no, delicious. I pushed again and again. And after about two minutes of exchange, he finally said, I have a, a question for you. Has it been raining often at your farm in Western Massachusetts in the last couple of weeks? Turned out to be a very smart question. Because on an all grass dairy, if it's raining a lot, you're washing out the grass and washing out the milk and ultimately the flavor of the butter. And in fact, the last couple of weeks have been torrential rainstorms that have been during Hurricane Irene. Crazy amounts of rain. So the dude could taste the weather. <laughs> I told him how impressed I was with it, and he got ready to leave. And then he turned around and he said, I've got another question for you. Was your butter made by hand, or was it made in a, in a mixer, in a Cuisinart? Indicating ever so gently that the butter had been made in a Cuisinart. No, I said, Mr. Ducasse, absolutely not. No, we know 
to only make the butter here at Blue Hill by hand because you get the proper viscosity. And if you make it in a, in a Cuisinart, it messes up the texture on the tongue and ultimately the flavor. I knew all of this. And I told him, no, absolutely. Made by hand always has been and always will be. And he said, almost apologized for even insinuating otherwise. Put on his coat and got ready to leave. And he got the door and he turned around kind of Columbo style and said, I got one last question. <laughs> he said, were the cows grazing near the barn or were they grazing in a field far away from the barn? I didn't even know that was a question. <laughs> but since I always saw the cows right next to the barn at Blue Hill Farm whenever I was there, I just immediately said, no, 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 the cows were grazing right near the barn. And he said, oh, thank you. He shook hands, and he was off. About a week later, I was up in the pastry kitchen. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the, the culinary extern making the butter in a Cuisinart. <laughs> I went over to the extern. I said, excuse me, what are you doing? Why are you making the butter in a Cuisinart? And the extern turned me very excited. He said, chef, I figured out that to make in a Cuisinart, it just goes so much faster. <laughs> Week and a half after that, I'm up at Blue Hill Farm. I'm standing at the edge of the field next to the barn overlooking the great expanse of the Berkshires, these beautiful pasture acres. But I don't see any cows. I turned to the farmer, Sean Stan. I said, Sean, where are the cows? Oh. I'm doing an experiment these last couple of weeks. I'm pasturing the cows in the furthest field, field seven. I said, Sean, why are you doing that? He said, well, field seven's in the worst shape. Lots of invasives, lots of weeds. We're bringing the animals back there to restore the pasture to the health and vitality that you see here next to the barn, this field. So Dukas could taste field seven, too. I left that meeting with Chef Ducasse. I think it changed my, there's sort of a before and after for me in my life as a, as a cook. Not, not because I wanted to be Ducasse. He's a Jedi. I'm not going to be a Ducasse. But I aspired to understand more about deliciousness and its connection to how something was grown or raised. And that's led me on a journey that hasn't, hasn't stopped. In fact, I determined pretty soon after that meeting that I was going to dig into wheat, into that einkorn wheat that I gave Dukas and that bread. I wanted to know einkorn like Dukas knew butter, which is why I found myself a couple weeks later in the middle of a 2,500-acre uh, 2, farm in, in western New York, Klaus and Mary Howell's grain farm. I was there because in this deep dive to wheat, I wanted to know the recipe for producing this jaw-dropping flavor. I'm standing in the middle of the field, I'm looking around. I didn't see much wheat. I saw a ton of cover crops. I saw other grains, a suite of other grains, the millet, barley, buckwheat, rye, sorghum. I saw tons of leguminous crops, the bean crops, the cow peas, and others. And I learned over the next couple of hours that Klaus Martins planted all of these in a meticulously timed rotation. And he was doing it to lock and load his soil with the proper biological health and activity that resulted in the wheat that was making me quite well known at Blue Hill. That without these other crops, that wheat did not have the flavor. And as an organic farmer, he was forced into these kind of negotiations, as we all know. Couldn't plant corn and soy, corn and soy, corn and soy. He had to figure out a rotation that gave his soil the kind of health, health and vitality that fought disease and pests. And, but also for customers like me who demanded the kind of flavor that we demanded. But what was I doing? I was supporting this tiny little slice of a very large and complicated ecological pie. I had nothing to do with 90% of the farm, nothing. And what happened to 90% of the farm? Well, the cover crops were just plowed in, and that fed soil micro, microorganisms. But all those other grains that I talked about, he didn't have market for it, because nobody in this country really eats barley or buckwheat. Where did they go? They went to animal feed. So it's organic animal feed. That's pretty good negotiation there. But pennies on the dollar for Klaus and Mary Howell and their farmers. They were making their money on the wheat and the organic corn. And I was only supporting that 
Sounds like the emperor without clothes, sitting there telling everyone they need to support organic wheat because it tastes better, it's more nutritious for sure. But I was doing nothing to support the entirety of the farm. I went back to the restaurant, and within days, I had a new dish called rotation risotto. <laughs> Klaus doesn't grow rice. It didn't have any rice. But it was an homage to all those rotation crops that I put into a risotto. And I did it so that the diners who came to my restaurant started to understand what we have all begun to have a language for, the nuts and bolts of what it means to farm organically, which is to support the whole farm. In fact, I was going through the restaurant not, not long after I introduced that dish. And one of the waiters fielded a question, I thought very, very smartly, from, from a kind of anxious, cynical New Yorker, which we, there are a lot back there. And the woman said, when she looked at the menu, what the hell is rotation risotto? And the waiter said, it's nose to tail of the whole farm. That's right, nose to tail of the whole farm. I realized that as a chef, I couldn't just proselytize about organic ingredients and about single organic ingredients. I needed to support the whole farm to really be organic and sustainable for the long term. And by the way, delicious, because those grains are quite delicious. Simultaneously to my understanding about what it meant to really support organic agriculture was my meeting this guy, Michael Mazurik. He came to eat at my restaurant. I served him that rotation risotto. He was asking all sorts of questions. Questions like Ducasse, I never even thought to answer. I never even thought to, there were questions like, like where, what, what type of barley? What type of buckwheat? I brought him into the kitchen to talk to him. Michael is a cucurbits breeder at Cornell. He breeds squashes, mostly. And so I said to him, sort of jokingly, it was late at night, and I was kind of just messing around with him. I, I, I looked at him, I said, you know, if you're, you're a squash breeder, why don't you, sorry, why don't you, why don't you take a butternut squash, which one of my cooks was prepping for a soup the next day. I said, why don't you take that squash, butternut squash, why don't you actually make it taste good? Like, why as chefs and home cooks, why do we have to go through these heroics to make butternut squash taste good? Add honey and maple syrup and, and roast it to get any kind of sugars out of it and get out the water. Now, why don't you do that as a breeder? And he looked at me, and I, you know, I was kind of joking around, but he looked at me very serious. And he said, you know, in all my years of breeding, no one has ever asked me to breed for flavor. It's like lights out, you know, curtain down. Like that Ducasse mode. I was just like, really? How is that even possible? And that started a journey for me over the last 10 years, where Michael started breeding for a new kind of butternut squash, a shrunken butternut squash, a squash that did, wasn't filled with 70% water. That was more dry matter. You had more of the flavor. What kinds of flavors? Well, that's what we started choosing in our, our adventure here over the next couple of years. And we ended up with Michael's honey nut squash. How many of you heard of the honey nut squash? Right on. A couple more years, and all these hands will be raised, I bet. It is stunningly delicious. I'm not saying that just because it's partly my baby. I'm saying it now because it's overtaken the squash market on the East Coast and increasingly all the way to the West Coast. It's going into Costco next year. This is a conversation that started off the cuff at midnight in my kitchen. Why don't you breed a butternut squash that actually tastes good? We had retailers, when we first had a prototype of a squash, you can hold it in your hand like that. They looked at that. They said, this will never work. Never work. Why would someone in a supermarket choose to buy this, held up that squash in the, in, in the palm of his hand, and then versus a butternut squash that's four times the size? That'll never happen. Another retailer said, oh no, we don't have a skew to fit that size. That'll never happen. <laughs> yeah, fast forward six years, and it's going into Costco. I just wanted to take you through for a minute how this worked. Because it was no, there was no conscious plan here. Like I said, it was an off-the-cuff challenge and conversation that resulted in breeding efforts between a chef, 
a Bringer Michael and the farm that's attached to the restaurant in Blue Hill called Stone Barns. And it started with that prototype that ultimately got into a small disruptive seed company in the Northeast. Didn't do that well, to be honest with you. Kind of like, it's part of the seed catalog, a new kind of butternut squash. No one, know, no one knew really what it was or what to do with it. But I started giving it to chefs. And chefs are like, chefs are like pit bulls when they get flavor. Just makes them look like better chefs. And they just went after it, started social meeting it, this, this new type of butternut squash. And it lit a fire that I, I couldn't, no one could ever predict it. It all of a sudden ended up at the Union Square Green Market. I remember uh, now five years ago, there was one honey nut squash at the Union Square Green Market, one, one grower. Last fall of the 13 growers at the Union Square Green Market, 12 of them were growing honey nut. But that year, one of them, and that lit a match that ended up with other seed companies taking up the honey nut. And then all of a sudden, jumped to distribution out of nowhere long distance distribution. And then from there, it was in Trader Joe's. That was three years ago. Blue Apron just harvested this past fall 1.9 million pounds of honey nut squash. It's been reviewed in all the major publications. Not as butternut squash, but as honey nut, which goes to show that it is now available across the country. A uh, baby food company just called Michael two years ago and said, now we've heard you have this tasty butternut squash. And we've gotten a lot of complaints from mothers that our, our baby food, our squash, play, our, our squash baby food doesn't taste good enough. Do you have, can, can we use it? Michael said, of course, gave it to them. And they had this industrial machinery that, that crunched the squash. It didn't work. They called Michael. They said, oh, I'm so sorry. Your squash is delicious. But we're locked and loaded into our industrial machinery. We can't use your squash. We have to go back to our butternut squash. Michael being Michael, took two years and now has a prototype of a squash with a triple thick skin, kind of like armor, that fits the industrial machinery. That's being introduced next year with new improvements. There's a, a, an oil seed company next door to this industrial complex, they heard about all this influx of new delicious squash. They tried, they test drove the seeds, realized it made the absolutely most delicious oil. I've, I've had it in my kitchen. It's, I think ultimately it's gonna replace olive oil for me. It is so awesome. So they're going into production based on the increase in production for this new kind of squash in a squash seed oil. That all just stemmed from one conversation and then I, I, there's no money invested here. I didn't invest any money. I don't make any money from this. We just brought this into the market based on flavor. And by the way, one other thing I left out of this, this thing called the ripeness indicator. This I had no idea about, and Michael didn't tell me until late inning, late inning revelation. The squash on the left, well, that's butternut squash. That goes from that ripe color to ripe color right away. Uh, it looks ripe no matter what. Actually, it's still green in the field. They pick it green. And then it's stored, and it ripens in storage a bit. The honey nut squash, and maybe the secret sauce to its success, is that it doesn't turn color until it's actually ripe on the vine. It's called the ripeness indicator. Michael bred that in in this classic breeding trick that, that, that is totally possible and totally cheap. But it requires the consumer now to notice that they're not going to eat uh, an immature butternut squash, they're going to want to eat the mature butternut squash. So the grower can't really pick it until it's mature. And that neat little breeding trick just doubled the carotenoids, tripled the overall nutrition of our butternut squash overnight. Just that trick alone. You're actually eating ripe squash. Last I checked, butternut squash is a superfood. I don't know what you call this honey nut squash, a super duper duper food. Simply by shoving out a bunch of the water, concentrating the flavors, delivering on the deliciousness. And as we know, deliciousness and nutrient density are the same thing, one and the same thing. To have nutrient density is to have flavonoids, to have flavonoids, to have flavor, period. You can't get flavor without nutrition. You can't get nutrition without flavor. Nice correspondence for a chef who's in pursuit of good flavor, and all of us who are in pursuit of deliciousness. 
Last year, we started that seed company I was mentioned before. It's called Row 7. And it's an attempt to pull into the marketplace deliciousness. And it's to do it for organic farmers. Because what was missing from Klaus's, Klaus Martin's, the grain farmer's brilliant methodical rotation of different grains were grains that actually tasted good. That barley and that millet and those, all those other grains that he was growing, most of them went to, to bag chicken feed and bag pig feed because there was no market. But the flip side of it, there's no market because those grains don't actually taste that good. And they are bred for pig food. As I've now discovered with this launch of the seed company, all these grain breeders, they're breeding for animal feed. They're not breeding for human feed. It's incredible that we are, when we go, when we are being told to eat more whole grains, like barley, like buckwheat, like millet, and yet we are eating the offshoot of, of animal feed. So the question for this company, the question for all of us as we move forward and desire to pull organic agriculture more into the mainstream, increase that 1%, which is inevitable, we have to eat the whole farm. And part of doing that is making these varieties more delicious. I was, I'm, I'm asked before this conference again and again, what is, what's the future? There was an executive from a, from a major retailer who turned to me on a panel the, not that long ago and said, what are the issues that I'm going to be dealing with? Why don't you tell me now so I'll know in a couple years what, what, the, what the consumer wants? And I'm saying to all of them the same thing I've been saying now since I've had this experience with High Nut Squash. The future is going to be based on deliciousness because consumers are becoming way, way too educated not, not to have it move in that direction. And we started the seed company to breed for that kind of flavor, to breed for regional organic food systems, regional organic food systems, to eat the whole farm, different grains, different vegetables, different roots, different legumes, that express themselves most deliciously, most nutritiously in a regional context. And our hope for the future is that we will think about this subject, some of the weighty issues that were talked about earlier this morning, and the pursuit of pleasure and deliciousness as one subject. And I encourage all of you to look at uh, the future of organic from a regional uh, specific context. Because I see the, the, the breeding work that goes into different regions that are so diverse and so specific that we should be looking at what is it that the South is looking for in a particular squash, which is what we're doing taking that honey nut squash and now breeding it specifically for southern climates versus the Pacific Northwest, versus Southern California, versus the Midwest. And instead of a one-size-fits-all approach, which will never work, dumbs down genetics, dumbs down the opportunity of the farmer to make an actual profit, can we think about breeding these delicious, nutritious varieties of vegetables and grains for the future, which people want more of, and which people will want more of because they're more delicious, can we breed them for specific regions? And can we use the power of chefs to help curate those varieties? That's the challenge. And I look forward to coming back to visit this conference in the future uh, and applaud your work. Because as was said earlier today, I just want to underscore that. It was said to me while I was sitting down here, organic was the original disruptor. I love that line. That's right. And as it has become more mainstream, we ought not to lose that kind of energy and enthusiasm and dig deeper into the themes and, and ideas that will change the world, one seat at a time. Thank you very much. <laughs>